Remain standing as I read our foundational scripture for today. Notice I don't call it a text, I call it a foundational, because y'all know the way I preach, I don't just use one text. So it's the foundation. The rest of it will be built upon this. Psalms 34, 11 through 14 says, Come you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Look, somebody say, watch your mouth, watch your mouth. <laughs> Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. You may be seated. This scripture is also recorded in the New Testament. Peter quotes it in 1 Peter 3, 10 through 12, reminding the same thing. And that is good because there are people who start teaching this stuff that the Old Testament, we don't need those scriptures anymore. If we didn't need it, the scriptures wouldn't be repeating it and reminding us what it says in the New Testament. But this scripture passage is attempting to give the reader and the listener a strategy for longevity. That's my subject today, a strategy for longevity. And I don't, can't remember if I heard somebody else say this or it came up out of my spirit. Sometimes I'll say things and then I'll just write it down. I had a note in my, in my Google Docs that said, when, when the Lord gave me a thought, it says, new sermon. And I wrote the title down, not knowing when I was going to preach it, but the Lord brought this back to me, a strategy for longevity. And this psalm basically gives two things you need to do, and we're going to unpack it even more, if we're going to have longevity. One, he said, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies, which is what I had to tell your neighbor. In other words, the first thing you need to watch your mouth. Now, I, now I, when, I even, when I even hear that, I'm, I'm a little triggered when I hear watch your mouth because my mother had a habit of slapping me and then saying watch your mouth. Now, I wish she said watch your mouth first, but I would say something and she would go, watch your mouth, okay? Uh, and the second thing, he says, turn away from evil and do good, search for peace and work to maintain it. So the second thing, he's talking about our behavior. He gives a strategy for longevity. He says, watch your mouth, what you say, and secondly, watch your behavior, what you do, if we're going to have longevity. Longevity is long duration. Longevity is enduring for a long time. And if you're going to have a strategy for longevity for your life, you have to start asking yourself some hard questions. Why do we need a strategy for longevity? Because I've been saying over the last several months now, we got to think long and wide. You got to think long. How is this going to affect me, my life, my family, my finances, my marriage, years down the road? And also thinking wide, who else is this going to affect? You know, you'd be surprised how many people make decisions. You know, pe people say things like, um, I, ain't, I ain't hurting nobody but myself. You ever hear people say that? When people say that, those are people who are not thinking long or wide, right? Because somebody loves them. You know, it's, it's like if, if when someone commits suicide, when someone commit, commits suicide, yes, they, uh, they may think that they're eliminating whatever troubles that they may be going through or whatever uh, issues they may have in their mind or whatever they're facing, but then other people are affected by that years later. Children are affected and, and uh, you know, sometimes people have to move out of a home because the home is where the person committed suicide. So when we make decisions, it doesn't affect just us. And so strategy for longevity, you have to ask yourself some hard questions about your life. And I, I, I think I said last week, you know, I know you're young now and you're partying now, but 
your, the plan for the rest of your life can't be to twerk the rest of your life. At some point, the twerking going to come to an end. Yeah. Brothers, I know you're running around chasing women, but there's going to come a time you can't catch them. <laughs> you, you ain't going to be able to catch them. So you, you got to have a strategy for longevity. I said to someone the other day, one of our entrepreneurs in our church, I said to him, I said, how long do you plan on working? He said, to 95 if I can. I said, do you really want to do that? He said, yeah. I said, but suppose you're not able to do that. Okay? He said, I enjoy it. And it's wonderful that you enjoy what you're doing, but I'm often telling people, what's your strategy for longevity? Because you may not be able to do what you're doing 30 years from now. You may, and what you're doing today may be irrelevant 30 years from now. The money you have today, what are you doing to maintain for years to come? So some of the hard questions you have to ask yourself regarding strategy for longevity is, how long will I, how long, or rather, excuse me, how will I maintain or sustain this? How will I maintain or, or sustain this? How long will this last? I know it seems real good now, but how long will this last? What will happen when or if? What will be the long-term effects of? You know, to me, to me uh, you know, when I, when I was coming, I heard something the other day. I heard something, uh, uh, and I was, I think I was on my way to the office. So I couldn't listen to the whole story. I think it was on NPR talking about, talking about how the, the, um, the tobacco industry really were targeting, at one point, African Americans. They targeted African Americans, and they came up with titles and names for the cigarettes, specifically, to go after African Americans, like Cools. Yeah, it was strategy. Cool to get African Americans, because, you know, back in the 70s, everybody wanted to be cool, okay? And to me, seriously, y'all, any, anybody who, to me, anybody who smokes don't have a strategy for longevity. Oh, and by the way, study just came out this week for, for all the cannabis advocates about smoking cannabis and all the, that you are 30 and 40% more likely to have a stroke or heart attack if you smoke cannabis. Weed, herb, tree. When I would come along, it was reefer. <laughs> Some of y'all don't even know what reefer is. But to me, people, you know, um, whew, Lord, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me, help me. What you do in your 30s and your 40s, you start paying the price in your 50s and your 60s. I know you got a lot of energy now. Don't, oh, Lord, help me. Help me, Jesus. Help me. I got to say what I got to say. With all that extra weight, how's that going to be 20 years from now? When, when your bones are different. No, come on. Uh, uh, don't get mad at me. I'm trying to help us think long term about a strategy for longevity. You can get a house and you're making all this money today. How are you going to pay for that house in 20 years from now when you retire? Are y'all listening to me? Strategy for longevity. A lot of this, these things can address simply by insurance. <laughs> okay? Insurance helps you to have longevity. Insurance helps you to answer the question of, how, how's this going to be maintained? What will happen if? Like, if I die, or, or put it this way, what will happen when I die? What's going to happen with my family? How are they going to continue this? What will be the long-term effects of this? What will this look like 10, 20, 30 years from now? All those are questions of longevity. And many of us, we only think for the moment. And I've been saying this for the last few months, we got to think long and think wide. Uh, Sus Susie Orman, many of you know who Susie Orman, she's a financial 
guru, coach, whatever, and um, I get these emails that, that, that she sends, and, and I guess they're targeted specifically to folks in my age bracket, okay? And uh, a recent email, it was addressed to retirees and people getting close to retirement, and, she, and, and, and I'm reading in the quotes, I'm quoting it. She said, if you have decided to stay put for a while till I'm in your house or forever, it's so important to make certain homes safe and comfortable to make your current home safe and comfortable for your retirement years. The time to do remodeling projects is now. If you can afford it, when you're healthy and can't imagine being a bit older with a few more aches or worse, at the top of the list of things to consider is whether you could comfortably, whether you could live comfortably on the first floor of your current home. He said, ask any contractor who's work, done work for older clients, and they'll tell you that they often get a call after somebody has fallen, after someone can't go upstairs, or just a wear and tear of old age, and now there's an immediate need to remodel the downstairs to have a bedroom, a bathroom that can accommodate a walker and a walk-in shower that doesn't require stepping into a bathtub. And the clients, they want it done immediately, and generally it's going to take some months. Why? Because somebody wasn't thinking about longevity. It's wise to think beyond today. It's wise to think beyond today. So they didn't have a, st a strategy for longevity. Now, the Bible speaks a lot about longevity. The Bible speaks a lot about longevity. Um, it says, he who endures to the end shall be saved. That's, that's recorded in three, three scriptures, in Matthew 10, 22, Matthew 24, 13, and Matthew 13, 13. He who endures to the end shall be saved. Talk about longevity. We all like to quote Psalm 91, he that dwelt in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. But then we get down there in that, in that uh, chapter, it says, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Can I tell you, it's the will of God for you to have a long life. I said, it's the will of God for you to have long life. I remember one of my friends um, several years ago, uh, they, they challenged me because I kept using the term about premature death. And they had never thought about premature death. They said, well, a person dies when he's supposed to die. And I said, no, that's not true. There's such thing as premature death. You died because you made bad decisions. They died because they didn't take care of their body. It wasn't just they died when they, God said, with long life will I satisfy you, okay? And even most of us traditionally in church, we've heard 70, 80 years, 70 and 80 years. But when, when you hear 70, 80 years, it was talking about Moses was complaining to God about the people dying off in the wilderness who had to die before the next generation go in. He said, Lord, the days, our days are only, are only uh, three score, a score is 20, three score, uh, three score 60 and 10. 70, he said, if they're really strong, they might live to 80. He was complaining that the people are dying too young. Because God tells us in Genesis, he said the man's days were supposed to be 120. So it's the will of God for us to live long lives. But we can do things to shorten those lives because we don't have a strategy for longevity. I know everything you eat is good to you, but you need to have a strategy for this longevity. Man shall not live by pig feet. And chitlins. You, you, you need a strategy, okay? You, you, you need, need a strategy. Proverbs 3 and 2, it says, first verse tells us, said, my son, listen to my words, listen to my commandments, get wisdom. Why? Because length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. So this tells us that we live by the word, y'all. We can have length of days and long life, living by the word. Now, I know we all want to go to heaven, but that don't mean we want to go today. Amen. So length of days and long life is what God wants, to, God wants us to live a good, long life here on earth. So you need a strategy for longevity. That verse from the message translation says, They'll help you live a long, long time, a long life, full and well. Come on, say, Lord, thank you 
that I live a long, long time, live full, and live well. Now, because I, I, I'll be honest. I mean, I, the Bible said you know, to be with the Lord is far better. So if I'm going to live here on earth, I, wanna live a, I, I want things to be well. You know what I'm saying? I want a quality life. Okay? I don't want to just say I'm here. It's like a marriage. You, you, you don't just want to, you, you, you don't want to have a long marriage. You want to have a quality marriage. Amen? So to avoid crisis in the future, you need a strategy for, for longevity. You need a strategy for longevity in the present. Psalm 34, 11 through 14. The New Living Translation of that verse that we read as our foundation scripture, it says, come my children and listen to me. And I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Does anyone want to live a life that is long and prosperous? Anybody want to live a life that's long and prosperous? Amen. Amen. Then keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. This is not legalism. This is not law. These are principles to have a good long life. You got to think long. That means you got to think about your decision today months, years, decades. And then you need to be thinking legacy. Legacy is, is, is beyond your life. I address the, I address the financial leaders of this church who... who, who who are, have over the years helped us to do the things that we do in a very significant way. And many of us are getting on in years now. And I addressed them and talked about, at this point, some of us, we're going to have to start thinking, we need to think about legacy. How do I continue to do and give to the things that I love and help maintain even my church that I love beyond my life? And there's ways that we can do that. And we're going to be talking about that and giving people opportunities to do that. But he says here that you got to think long. You got to think months. You got to think years. You got to think decades. You got to think legacy beyond today. Now, yo, we all know that one of the things that immature people do, let's, let's say children, teenagers, they only think for today. Am I right? Am I right about it? Okay. <laughs> they only think for today. And, and, that's, and that's understandable when you're kids. But when you grow up, you can't just think for today. You, you just can't think for today. You know, my, he hasn't done it now, but some of y'all know I, I ride a motorcycle. Have, have I rode it this year? I don't think I rode it this year. I've been warm enough to ride this year. But, but uh, years ago, Tyler used to say, Dad, I'm going to get a motorcycle too. And I said, I said wait. Wait. I, I, wait. Wait till you... 30 something and you're married and you got some children because when you're married and you got children you think about how what I do how that's going to affect them when, when, when I see these fools I mean these people <laughs> riding down the interstate on one of those whatever they call those motorcycles just doing 100 miles an hour going in and out I'm like that's a fool right there that's obviously somebody who's not thinking long and strong that's somebody who's not thinking, don't have a strategy for longevity. As you get older, you start realizing, no, I, I'm responsible for people. What I do is going to affect somebody else. I can't just live for myself. Living for yourself is selfish. So you got to think long, then you got to think wide. Wide means, how will my choices affect my spouse? How does my choices affect my children? How does my health affect other people. Amen. How do my finances, how's that going to affect um, other people? I was watching something last night and, on, you know, I ain't really put, throwing him up under the bus. He threw himself under the bus. But I was watching last night, they had this new um, series coming on CNN called United States of Scandal. Have any of us seen it? The very first one, they covered our former governor. Sanford. Remember when he was supposed to be going for, he was, our governor was gone. He was like AWOL. So Y'all didn't know nothing about it. We didn't know where he was. And he was taking a trip, supposedly, on the Appalachian Trail, where he really was going to see his boo thing down in Argentina. And he lost his mind. 
And he came back, and, and, and they, they showed when the person finally confronted him coming from Atlanta, they suspected him. They said, and they said, Governor, where you come from? And he, and he freaked out, and then he came right back and had a press conference. And, and, and they were talking about how he just, like, expected everybody just, like, to understand. You know, you know I've fallen in love. <laughs> you got a wife and kid, but I've fallen in love. And, uh, you know, it's, it's insane. This just wasn't a sexual thing. I'm in love. Like that, like we care. Then they showed last night John Edwards. Anybody remember John Edwards? Oh, John Edwards was the man. John Edwards, uh, Barack Obama ended up getting the nomination. But John Edwards, he was, I mean, he was, he was young. He was, he was attractive. He had it going on. And they thought that he was probably going to be the next presidential candidate. But he had an affair with a woman on his, on, his, um, on his campaign, and then he got her pregnant. And he, and he white. <laughs> I know this sounds like Negroid stuff. <laughs> I, see, don't, don't be making this, don't, don't be stereotyping people. Okay? And he got her pregnant, and then he tried to have somebody else on his campaign to say it was his baby. And they, they were covering this last night, how he just dug in. He just kept digging in. They were like, just stop. Just acknowledge I, I messed up. And he kept digging in. No, and, and, then, and now why some of y'all even remember. The National Enquirer is the one who exposed this. No, the other ones wouldn't do it. And the National Enquirer ended up getting a pull of surprise. Because no, they uncovered this. They even had a picture. He goes to California to, take, to have a picture of him going to visit her with the baby. And then he's on ABC News, and they ask him about it. And he says, I don't recognize that picture. I don't know where this picture comes from. I don't know who this child is. And everybody's like, stop. Just stop. And on top of that, let me add, he, his wife was dealing with breast cancer. And then his wife ended up dying while he's telling all these lies on a campaign trail, having an affair. Obviously, and he kept digging in and kept, he, would, he did not think about how his life was going to affect other people. At his wife's funeral, I was watching on the news, at, at his wife's funeral, he comes out and he takes his kids to the car. And he had, look, and you see, he asks his kids, are they okay? And it looked like he tried to lean into his daughter and the daughter does like this. You can get so caught up in your flesh that you don't think, how, do, how does this affect other people? How does this affect other people's lives who love me, whose name is connected to me? One of the things I've often thought about, okay, is that, you know, I'm a junior. My father did not live a very good life, okay, did not have a very good name, okay? And so it, I guess it's the positive thing is that as I grew up, he wasn't around. But I often think about that. I often think about people who call their kids the second and the third, and then you mess up your name, which now has messed up their name. You got to think long, and you got to think wide. Everybody say longevity. longevity. So you got to think about your decisions today. How it will affect tomorrow? I think, I think it was uh, uh, um, um, Aretha Franklin who said, you got to think. Think about what you're trying to do to me. Come on, think, think, think. <laughs> now think about how your decisions affect tomorrow. So strategy for longevity, first of all, it requires preparation. Everybody say preparation. And when the Bible tells us about preparing, it takes us to a very simple animal or insect. Proverbs 6, 6 to 8. It says, go to the ant. He said, just, just go look at an ant. Proverbs 6, 6, he said, Go to the ant, you sluggard. Sluggard means you lazy person. Let me add, lazy, trifling, good for nothing. No, don't say all that. Just sluggard. It means somebody's lazy. Say, just go to the ant. He said, consider her ways and be wise. Learn from the ant, which has no guide, no overseer, and no ruler. I'm, I'm convinced that the more integrity you, you have, the less you need somebody looking over your work. The more integrity you have, the more you need to have to punch a clock. 
which having no guide, no overseer, no ruler, provideth meat in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. He said the ant prepares because the ant like, I ain't gonna be out here in this snow looking for some food. So I need to get the food in the summer so I can go underground in the winter. And he's saying that, a, that a ant prepares. If you're gonna have a strategy for longevity, you need to be preparing for your future. You need to be preparing for your children's future. You need to be preparing for your grandchildren's future if you can. Proverbs 30, 25, it says, the ants are people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. So a que rhetorical question, are you preparing? Are you preparing for being older? Are you preparing for how things are going to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Regarding your finances? Regarding your relationships? I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. So you got to think about tomorrow and the long-term results of your decisions today. You got to think about tomorrow and the long-term decisions, the long-term results of your decisions today. So the text says, keep your mouth from speaking guile and basically walk in the ways of God. You got to realize that everything you do and everything you say today are seeds planted for tomorrow. Let me say that again. Everything you do and everything you say today are seeds for tomorrow. Now, what is a seed? A seed is something sown small, but it grows big. A seed is something that can even look insignificant, but it produces something very significant. Look at Mark 4. Mark 4, 31, 32, when Jesus starts talking about seed, he says, uh, it's like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth, when it starts off, when it's sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. Talking about a mustard seed. It is so small, he says, the smallest seed in the earth. But when it's sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out great branches so that the fowls of the air can lodge under the shadow of it. And as I looked at that verse, I started thinking about, now, this is a good thing. It's a good thing that he's saying, you know, it starts off as a small seed, becomes a mustard tree and great branches, and now uh, birds can lodge in it. But do you want everything you're doing today to grow? Do you want whatever you're doing today to have more branches? And that's, that's what I say to y'all a lot about how we live our lives in front of our children. Because you're planting seeds, you're going to have more branches of that. I saw, I saw, I saw that in my family. I saw them sow, that, sow those seeds of, of, of everybody shacking, living together, and now third generation, everybody just shacking. Nobody getting married because it became what they saw. They sowed seeds, now they got branches. Do you want to have branches from the activity that you're having today? Every day we're sowing seeds to our actions. Every day we're sowing seeds to our actions. Psalms 112, five and six, it says a good man showeth favor and lendeth. So see a good man you know, helps other people out and he will guide his affairs with discretion, and surely he will not be moved forever. I mean, he go through something, but he's gonna come out of it. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. You know, I grew up hearing stuff like, you know, it, it don't matter, it, uh, you know, every, every, everything was about heaven to hell. So the people say, it don't matter how you live, uh, if you don't receive Jesus, you're going to hell. Yeah, I get that. I get that. But good deeds are rewarded in, in the earth. Now, good deeds don't necessarily get you going to heaven, but good deeds can make you have some good relationships. Good deeds can give you a good name. Good deeds can make somebody want to help you. No, no, you, you can't do, do, do good deeds to go to heaven. You do good deeds, okay, to build relationships with people. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Psalms 120, Psalms 112 and 9, it says, this good man, he has dispersed abroad, that's talking about being generous, he's given to the poor, 
and his righteousness endures forever. His home will be exalted with honor. He said the person who does good helps people and bless people, it produces great harvest for his life and for his family years to come. Often think about the Bible says that when Solomon got ready to build the temple, he needed temper, timber or lumber. And he writes a letter to Hiram, the king of Lebanon. And the first thing he says, Hiram was glad to help him because Hiram was ever a lover of David. In other words, David had built such a relationship that now when his son needed something, he had no problem giving it to him. So he had sown some good seeds that was now going to be resurrected in the life of his son. Every day we're sowing seeds also with our words. Our words. Look at your neighbor. Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. James 3rd chapter, verse 4 and 5, when James wants to tell us, try to let us see how significant this tongue is, this mouth is, he said, look at a ship. Look at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member of our body, but it boasts great things. Little members, but it does great things. See how great a forest and little fire kindles? These, fire, these, these forest fires that we see, usually it's many times, you realize that started with a cigarette. And it can end up burning down thousands of acres. And he's saying that's what our tongue does. And yet many of us, we don't think about it. We say anything and we just, you know, we just always wagging it. And you got to be thinking about what you're saying. James 3 and 3, the message translation of that verse, it says, a small rudder on a huge ship in the hands of a skilled captain sets a course in the face of the strongest winds. A word out of your mouth may seem of no account, but it can accomplish nearly anything or destroy it. Every day, we are building up something or destroying something with our mouth. For those of us who are parents, we're building our children up or we're destroying them with our mouth. We're encouraging them or discouraging them with our mouth. We are giving them a positive attitude or we're giving them a negative attitude with our mouth. So something will be produced or fail to be produced based upon something that we've said or something we've done. I remember, I remember the first time I, that, that whatever your life is today is a result of your words on yesterday. First time I heard it, I'm like, what? Okay. But basically we're saying that we're living in today the harvest of what we were speaking. So if, if you would say, man, I'll never have no money, it's no wonder why you never have any money. You prophesy your own future with your words. This is, not, this, is not, this is not new age stuff, this is Bible. Something will be reproduced or fail to be reproduced based upon something that we have said or something we've done. Matthew 12. Matthew 12, verse 36, this verse really bothers me. I'm going to tell you why here in a moment. It says, but I say to you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Every idle word they shall give an account in their judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, or by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Every idle word you're going to give an account. Well, I don't understand. If it's an idle word, why, why do I have to give an account for it? Okay? So that tells me there's really no such thing as an idle word. Are y'all with me here? All fire is hot. There's no such thing as, as non-hot fire. Every word we speak produces something or is not producing something. Every word we speak is increasing something or decreasing something. So the Bible said we got to give an account. Everybody say account. Account is mathematical term, a, a, a accounting term. I mean, in other words, something's going to be either credited or debited from our lives based upon what we say. 
Something going to show up or something not going to show up. Something going to be there or not be there. Something going to be added or taken away. Something going to be credited or debited based upon what we say. So watch your, watch your mouth. A strategy for longevity, I got to watch what I be saying. Okay? I, I was listening on, on, on the way here on Sunday morning. There's a, I ain't going to mention, but there's a, um, a preacher who I know, he, he's preached for us. He usually brings re, re, really good word, but he, he was joking, talking about, he, was, he, was, he preached actually from Proverbs 3 about wisdom. And he was saying, um, he went to the movies and saw his friend. He said his friend uh, had, he said he had the largest bucket of popcorn he had ever seen. He said it must have been a $20 book. He said, and he had, he had butter on butter on butter on butter on butter on butter. You know, because, you, know, you know, we like it layered. We want, we want it to be on the seeds at the bottom. <laughs> he said, all this butter. He said, and then he ordered that Diet Coke. <laughs> then he was laughing, but, but, and th then he said this. He said, man, it's too late. You dead now. I said, oh, you know, he, I'm like, why, why are you going to kill the man? He said, he, he, he was joking, you know. He said, uh, man, it's too late, you're dead now. Sometimes we, we say things like that. Um, my, 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 my son was telling me about, uh, about someone a, a couple weeks ago who said, who, who, who said uh, you know, I, I'm, not sure about, I'm not sure I'll be here when this happens. And uh, he said, no, you, you don't say, don't, don't even talk like that. He called me up and he said, Dad, she just died. Look at him and said, watch your mouth. A lot of stuff we're joking about, but it ain't funny. You know, poverty ain't funny. You know, some of us, some we, we grow up joking about poverty. Man, I'm so broke, I can't pay no, can't pay no attention. You ain't joking about that when you get foreclosed on your house. A lot, of these, a lot of these jokes that we're saying, we got to really be watching our mouth. By your words going to be justified, by your words going to be condemned. Ecclesiastes 5, 6 and 7. Now look at this. Don't let your mouth cause your flesh to sin. The undotted translation says, Don't write a check that you can't cash. <laughs> Don't let your mouth cause your flesh to sin. Nor say before the messenger of God, that's on my angel, that it was an error. My bad, I didn't mean that. Look at this. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there's vanity. Fear God. Watch what you're saying. So this also tells me you can be working on something and God can be blessing it and you start saying the wrong thing. And the works of your hand are destroyed. Just imagine in, in the middle of us building this project, say, man, we ain't going to never get this, but the money ain't going to never come in. Even if you get started, but now you're cursing your future with your words. So we create and we give life to our thoughts by speaking them. How do, how do, how do we create and give life to our thoughts? By speaking them. Proverbs 18:20, it says, A man's mouth will be satisfied from the fruit, a, man, a man's stomach will be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth, from the produce of his lips. He shall be filled. Nice poetic way of saying, you're going to have exactly what you say. You're going to have exactly what you say. Your stomach is going to be satisfied with what you've been producing with your mouth. So our mouth produces things. And for the produce of his lips, he's going to be filled. So there are three basic areas, three basic areas that we really need to have a strategy for, for longevity about. And I'm not sure I'll get through them all today, but let me at least start. Number one, you got to have a strategy for relationships. I've seen too many people just mess up good relationships. 
You know, they got this thing called ghosting today. And y'all ever been ghosted? I heard people talking about being ghosted. And, uh, and, and they say, have you ever been ghosted? I was watching the television show. Then I realized, I think I told them past Marshall. I said, I realized I, I got ghosted. I didn't really, I hadn't thought about it. I have, I have a friend who I confronted him about something, his lifestyle, and he ghosted me. Don't, won't, won't respond to a text. If I come to town and visit, he don't take my calls. Got ghosted. And there are people who know that we were friends like since I was a teenager, and they're like, what? There ain't no way. They can't imagine. But some people, they don't know how to manage even conflict in relationships. And let me tell you something. If you have a friend who can't tell you the truth, that ain't a real friend. You need a cheerleader. A, cheer, a friend ought to be able to tell you the truth. I often say this, you can't see your own butt. You need a friend to help you see your butt. And so sometimes you need to be able to take things from people who are close enough to see it and receive it. So first thing I want to tell you about is you need to have a strong a strategy for longevity in relationships. Interpersonal relationships are critical to longevity. Interpersonal relationships are critical to longevity. Now, I don't know if you all heard me say this. When, when, when I moved to Maine, I worked for my uncle. And um, I, again, to this day, it, and, and, I, and I'm 62 years old, and I've never met anyone in my life as unscrupulous as this man. There may be people, but I don't know them. I mean, the people in terms of who I personally had to be, I never met anyone with that much lack of integrity. I'm sure there may be, but again, me personally. And so we were, it was an executive recruiting firm. Executive recruiting firm, I call you up, you engineer, and I talk to you about a job that's over here, and I try to tell you about the job and try to get you to leave your company and go take this job over here, and we got a commission from it. And I remember telling him, I said, listen, I said, I said, I almost had him, I said, but he, his job, the current company he's with is matching his, four, his 401k 100%. And he said, well, just tell him that they, that they match it too. I said, but that's not true. They only match 50%. He said, by the time he find out, he'll be on the job. He said, by the time he find out, he'll, he'll, he'll be on the job. I said, I can't do that. He said, listen, get the money and move on. There's always another sucker out there. Can you imagine somebody thinks like that? Pretty soon you're going to run out of suckers. And the sucker's going to rebel against you. And the sucker's going to come and beat you up. You can't just keep abusing people and think you're going to get away with that in life. That's going to come back to bite you. And so I never knew anyone who thought like that. When, when I thought, he, he felt you could just take advantage of people because there's always another customer. Take advantage of people because there's always going to be somebody else to take advantage of. Just profit, get what you can from people, and move on. Interpersonal relations are critical to, to, to longevity. First one I want to talk about is, is us as parents. Parents. Relationship with your parents is important. Amen. I grew up most of my life without, without my parents. Ephesians 6, 2 and 3 says, honor your father and your mother. It said, honor them. Which is the first commandment with promise. Watch this. And it's a strategy for longevity. That it may be what? Well with you and you may what? Live long on the earth. I was talking to another pastor about someone. I said, man, this person is really great. He has a great ministry. And I said, I said, there's only one thing I'm concerned about. I said, he don't really respect his parents. His parents don't have much influence. They don't listen to his parents. And he said to me, he said, well, that ain't going to last long. I said, huh? He said, well, then, then, then it's not going to last long. And I said, well, why did you say that? And then he reminded me of this scripture. Honor your father and your mother, 
that your days that will go well with you and your days will be what? Now watch this. You honor your mother and your father because they're your mother and your father. Now I'm, I'm going to go deeper because suppose they ain't honorable. Just chill out. The first thing you honor them because that's your mother and your father. There's a certain honor what, there, there's some of you I have a closer relationship with others here in this church, but many of you, you will honor me just because, even if you didn't know me, if your first day here, never seen me on television or heard on radio, and you met me and somebody said, well, he's the pastor, there's a certain honor you will give me just because I'm the, I'm, you find that I'm the pastor because of my position. Am I right? And so you honor your father and mother, first of all, because that's your mother and your father. It didn't even say they're supposed, they don't, they don't, they don't have to earn the honor. <laughs> the former president one day, <laughs> the former president, he, he was at a press conference one day and somebody asked him a question and he said, don't ever talk to me like that. I'm the president of the United States. And I, I thought to myself, if you were acting in a way that was more honorable, you wouldn't have to tell somebody, don't talk to me like that. But the truth of the matter is, there is a certain amount of respect that he's due, whether we like it or not, because he's the president of the United States. And the Bible says, honor kings and all those who are in authority, right? So first of all, parents. But now let, let's go a little deeper. But parents, you also have an obligation to be honorable before your children. You should be honorable before your children. You should want your children to honor you Listen to me, from a heart of appreciation and not merely a duty of obligation. Let me say that again. Parents, you should want your children to honor you from a heart of appreciation and not merely a duty of obligation. So you don't have to tell them, you don't talk to me like that, I'm your mother. You don't talk to me like that, I'm your father. If, if you are honorable, you don't, have, you don't have to go through that. Ephesians 6 and 4, New Living Translation says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. That tells me as fathers and parents, we can be mistreating our children. And I'm talking about beyond just being infants and spanking them, even beyond that. Rather, bring them up in the discipline and the instruction that comes from the Lord. And some of our instruction, we got to start getting it from the Lord and not our tradition. Well, my mama did this, my daddy did that, and they said, and, you know, I, I, I mean, I was beat with extension cord. I never beat my children with extension cord. Well, God didn't get that switch. I would tell them, don't come back. <laughs> then some of y'all were real abusive, made them braid the, braid the switches. Honor them with the instruction that comes from the Lord. That verse from the Amplified says, Fathers, do not irritate and provoke your children to anger. You're just irritating them and provoking them to anger. Do not exasperate them to resentment, but rear them tenderly in the training and discipline and the counsel and the admonition of the Lord. Now watch this, because when you think long and wide, you realize the way that I treat my children will depend on whether I see my grandchildren. Let me say it again. You got to think long and wide. The way you treat your children will determine whether you see your grandchildren. Because, and if they felt that they were abused by you and even verbally, why would they want to, if they can protect their children from going through what they went through with you? I did that. I did not, I deliberately did not have my children around Aunt Dottie. She was verbally abusive. We went there at the last, I mean, I, I, would be in, I would be in Jersey City the whole week. We stopped by to see her, the, the plane leaving at one o'clock. I stopped by to see her at 12. Well, we're on the way to the airport. She said, well, when y'all get here, I changed the subject. You got to think long and think wide. But you will reap a reward through your children. 
If you treat your children right and think long and wide about this relationship, you'll reap a reward. Did y'all know in the Bible there was no social security? In the Bible, there was no 401k, no 43B, no pensions. Children were the pension. Children were your social security. Which means in the Bible, I'm sure they will really think about it. I better, I better treat this boy good. He's going to need, he gonna need to take care of me. You'll reap reward through each other. 1 Timothy 5 and 4. It says, the context here is that the early church, they were debating and they were confused. They were, uh, it was the widows were starting to be taxing on the church. Remember the church early would take care of widows and all that and help provide for them. Again, no social security and all that. And so uh, uh, Paul says, listen, he says, now, we can't be taking care of all these folks. Church ain't got that much money. He said, this is what we're going to do. He says, let it be widows indeed. He said, they need to be 60 and older. He said, and they need to be having no children or grandchildren or whatever. He said, uh, he said, because he said, because if they're younger than, than, than six, he said, tell them, tell them, go get another husband. That's what the Bible says. Somebody said, ain't that simple? <laughs> so, First Timothy five and four, he said, but if, if any be a widow and has children or grandchildren, let those children or grandchildren first learn to show piety at home and repay their parents. For this is good and acceptable before the Lord. So if you treat your children well, think long and think wide, they will repay you. Now, to repay, you first got to pay. You can't have a harvest where you haven't sown seed. And some of us, we don't have good relationships with our children. And some of it is just dysfunction that you had from your mother, from her mother, and her mother, and you talk to people any kind of way, you're cussing, you're cussing your, your kids out, you're yelling and screaming all the time, you say things that you think is funny, that's really hurtful. And then they don't want to be around that. You will reap reward through your children if you think long and think wide. Proverbs 31, 26 to 28. Y'all get anything out of this? Proverbs 31, 26 to 28. It talks about, you know, we, we know about this, the virtuous woman who does all this stuff, right? Takes care of the house, takes care of the husband, takes care of the servants. Then it goes on to say, Proverbs 31, 26, she opens her mouth with wisdom. She what? No, that means she knows what to say. I know a lot of you open up your mouth, but do you open it with wisdom? So she knows what to say. And on her tongue is the what? Law of kindness. So this mother, when she speaks, she speaks wise and she speaks kind. She speaks wise words and she speaks kind words. She watches over ways of her household. She, in other words, she takes care of the children, take care of the house. And she does not eat the bread of idleness. Y'all know what that means? She ain't lazy and trifling. Now, you can't be open your mouth with a lot of foolish talk, be mean with your mouth, don't take care of the house, sit on your behind all the time, and get verse 28. Because what happens to this woman? who opens the mouth with wisdom, and the woman who has the law of kindness, the one who watches over her house. Verse 28, her children rise up and call her blessed, and her husband also, and he praises her. Now, this is years to come, a strategy for longevity. You got to be thinking, if I treat my children well today, if I take care of my children well today, later on, they're going to bless me. Now, I got to go a little deeper here because some of y'all, you, you, are, you are after everything else other than investing in your children. And these jobs aren't loyal. And these careers aren't loyal. And at the end of the day, you're going to have your children and your family and you don't get the years back. Right. 
You don't get them back. You can add on. Yes, Lord, give you a longer life, but you don't get those years back. Her children rise up and call her blessed. The New Living of that verse says, her children stand and bless her, and her husband praises her. This is, this is a strategy for longevity. This is years down the line. Now, starting off, you may be grinding with those kids. Starting off, it ain't easy with those kids. Starting off, feel like those kids getting on your last nerve. Starting off, if it ain't one thing, it's another. But if you invest it and put it, put the right time in, the right words in, the right kindness in, and not be idle, not be lazy, when it comes to investing in your children, they rise up and bless you. Amen. The message translation says, her children respect and bless her. I won't even ask. But there may be people here who you really don't respect your parents. I have to honestly say, as I look back, okay, I didn't, I, from an adult standpoint, I don't respect my parents. I don't respect them because they put everything else, looked to me, everything else first before us. And looking back now, and all the more after raising children and seeing what it takes and the choices you make, her children respect and bless her, and then her husband joins in with words of praise. That's a strategy for longevity with your children. Second thing I want to tell you, you got to treat people well. Look at somebody say, treat people well. You have, I'm talking about relationships. You have a strategy for long. You got to know how to manage relationships. You can't just keep thinking more people going to show up. Luke 16, 1 through 9. Jesus says that there was a certain rich man that had a steward, one of his employees, and an accusation was brought to this man, brought about this man, that this man was wasting his goods. He's supposed to be managing your money, but he, 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 he's stealing, he's embezzling. Verse 2, so he called him and said, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of thy stewardship. Let me see the records. How you been spending the money? For you can no longer be steward. He said, if I find out that, you, that, that there's a dime missing, you can fire it. Verse 3, then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I'm about to lose my job. He realized he's about to lose his job. And he says, I cannot dig and I'm ashamed to beg. Okay? I cannot dig. He said, I'm a white collar worker. I work with paper. I work with numbers. I work in the office. I just can't go out here and start digging because I get fired. He said, I'm resolved what I'll do. Then when I'm put out of the stewardship, when I lose my job, when I no longer have the regular check, I no longer have the income, they may receive me into their houses. He said, I got to manage relationships well so that when stuff goes down with me, somebody be willing to help me. Are y'all with me here? So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, how much do you owe the master? He said, I owe him 100 measures of oil. He said, quick, quick, then take the bill, sit down and, and write, write it for 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, I owe 100 measures of wheat. He said, well, take your bill and just write it out for 80. So the master, verse 8, this is what I want you to see. The master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd, King James says, wise in their day, in their generation, than the sons of light. And a lot of debate about this scripture, but here's the point. The point is in verse 9. I say to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they, those friends, may receive you into an everlasting home. What he's saying here, you need to manage your relationships and even your finances in a way that when you don't have anything, somebody's willing to help you. But if you mismanage relationships, let me show you how you mismanage relationships. You mismanage relationships by not doing what you say you're going to do. By not showing up when, you, when, you, when you're supposed to show up. 
by taking advantage of people and borrowing money and never paying them back and then running from them. They come down one aisle in Walmart and you running down the other one. You miss man's relationship. And he's saying here, if you manage relationships right, somebody will be willing to help you. Now, let me, let me show you another principle that I've often taught y'all. You know, we, especially we as a people, we always feel, we feel real bad and real sorry for people who, who seem like they have nothing. My question, why do you have nothing? You got to come to me. You don't even know me. You coming to me? You don't even know me. What about all the people you know? You got a mother, you got a father, sister, brothers, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends. You can't go to any of them that you got to come outside of all your family and friend circle to come to somebody you don't know? See, now you need to ask some questions. How many bridges have you burned? How have you messed up all those relationships that you don't have anybody that will help you? Because we all got people we know we're going to help. You know, I, and, I mean, and, you know, fam, family will help you even when they cuss you out, they help you. Every time I turn around, you need something. I'm so sick of you with your trifling self. And then you give them the money the whole time. Family will help you. But when you see people who mismanage all their relationships, you're next in line. And then I've watched people do this thing of just cutting people off. Part of being an adult and part of being a productive person, I'm looking for some, some more word, a high-functioning person, is knowing how to work through conflict. You're not going to agree with everybody on everything, but this whole thing just cutting people off because you disagree. Y'all, y'all, we all know, I ain't never talked to them again. I ain't never saying nothing. What, what, they, what they do? I know a, know a preacher one time, he got up and told his church, because this particular funeral home, he was doing something. He asked the funeral home to give him some money to help them, and the funeral home didn't give it to him, so he got him told his church, don't y'all, if any of y'all, if any of y'all think you're going to have your funeral here, you better not use so-and-so. Because he didn't do something to help us. Sometimes you're just being petty. Sometimes you got to know how to navigate through relationships. And... Here's something else you got to learn as a high-function person. Just because you don't like somebody don't mean I, don't mean I got to dislike them too. Just because you have a problem with somebody don't mean I have to have a problem with them. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's you. So you got to know how to manage these relationships. Proverbs 17, 17. Manage these relationships. A friend loveth sometime. Friend loveth what? If you're going to be a friend, be a friend. A friend loveth at all times, and a brother's born for adversity. So I, a couple years ago, I discovered something about friends. A friend will be there for your highest days and your lowest days. There may be a lot of insignificant days in between, but on your highest days, your wedding, your lowest days, your funeral, or, or, or a funeral of a, of a close loved one, they're going to be there. They'll go out of their way. A friend loved at that all time, the highest days and the lowest days. And a brother is born for adversity. A brother is born for when you're trouble. You got a friend when you're down and troubled and you need a helping hand. That's what a friend is for. Proverbs 18, 24. But then he says, if you're going to have friends, you want to take some responsibility. Look at this, y'all. I'm just about done for today. Proverbs 18, 24. A man that has friends must show himself what? Friendly. If you want to have a friend, you got to be a friend. A man that has friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So being friendly means, you know what this means? That means you're not just always just on the receiving end. You're on the giving end. And you all have people who, who you know as soon as the phone rings, they, they're about to ask you for something. And they call you their friend. And I've discovered something. And, and you got to recognize this. You are their friend, but they're not your friend. Let me say that again. You, and they will tell everybody what a good friend you are. 
Man, if I need anything, I can always call. I can always call Slick, man. Slick, Slick gonna come through for me, man. Slick is a good friend, okay? Uh, you are a good friend to Slick, but Slick ain't your friend. But a friend, a real friendship goes to, it's a two-way street. So if you're gonna manage long relationships and have, have longevity relationships, you can't merely be a taker. Proverbs 19, 6 and 7. Proverbs 19, 6 and 7. Oh boy. <laughs> Many will entreat the favor of a prince, and everyone is a friend to him that giveth gifts. So you want a friend? You need to be a giver. All the brethren of the poor do hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He said, you always broke, never have nothing. You're going to lose all your friends. All the brethren of the poor do hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? You always got your hand out. And I'm, I'm explaining how you do this. Everybody don't have the same economics. We don't all make the same money. But try to contribute something. If I pay for the whole meal, contribute to the tip. Man, I thank you, man. I, put something to the tip. Pay, pay for my valet parking. Contribute something to this. How you treat people matters. Psalm 37, 1 and 2. I'm done. Psalm 37, it says, Do not fret yourself because of evildoers, nor be envious of the works of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. He said, folks that don't treat folks right ain't going to last long. He said, don't be envious thinking that they got it going on and you know they're not good people, treat everybody nasty. He said, they ain't going to last long. Drop down to verse 7. Rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his ways, because the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger. Chill out. And forsake wrath. Do not fret it. Only, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be what? They're going to be cut off. They're not going to have longevity. But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Let me end with this scripture, 2 Timothy 4.14. In 2 Timothy 4.14, Paul talks about this guy named Alexander. It's only, one of the only times we see about Alexander. Paul don't say a whole lot about Alexander. But Paul says this about He said, Alexander, Smith, he did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. Now, what that means, I don't know. And then he warns people, he said, now I'm warning you, stay away from Alexander. He said, Alexander has caused me much harm. May the Lord reward him according to his works. Because God has, a, and you don't have to try to get revenge on people. God has a way of fixing this stuff, y'all. My mama said it this way. God don't like ugly. Miss Sealy said it this way. What you do to me, already done to you. Come on, let's stand. Strategy for, for longevity. Scripture says in 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. God says, I want things to go well with you. I think I want things to go well with you, with your family, with your relationships. But we got, there's a part we play in this. Amen?